Greetings and welcome to this edition of BEP Talks, where we bring you the beliefs, experiences, and passions of very diverse individuals from all around the world, different areas of expertise, who generously share, well, their beliefs, their experience, and their passions with you, all in an intention to help inspire, motivate, educate, and sometimes even entertain. I am so excited to get started with today's BEP Talk. So I'm just going to say, without further ado, please welcome today's guest, Megan Criley McKay. There she is. Hello, hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us here today. Megan, I have to say, that was a very short introduction because I'm so eager to have you speak. And I am so intrigued by different phrases that in, in vetting you for a BEP Talks, find extremely curious that mm -hmm. I want you to share more about things like human intelligence, Department of Defense, soft interrogation. Mm -hmm. These phrases absolutely, of course, artificial intelligence and kind of comparing it that weighing it against the human intelligence. Who are you? Thank you so much for asking, Beth. So my name is Megan Criley McKay, and I am known as the soft interrogator. I have over 30 years as a subject matter expert in human intelligence and former certified interrogator with the Department of Defense. My passion is speaking on group settings, companies, corporations, and keynote stages sharing the message in today's artificially intelligent workforce about what is human intelligence. Human intelligence is not just your IQ. And believe it or not, it does sound like an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> right? Yeah. Depending upon the generation that you were brought into this world and what your role is in society, at home, and at work, you might interpret human intelligence differently. Well, the reality of human intelligence is as neuroscience and information and technology have advanced, we are identifying so many different realms of different kinds of intelligence that I bring to the forefront. What are these kinds of intelligence? And most importantly, how technology, especially in today's augmented workforce, is diminishing our abilities to use them to ideally advance and learn skills and help upskill and lead the future workforce. So is, is technology actually contributing to the dumbing down of human yes, intelligence? Yeah, so there is a lot of research that is being done and it's been done for over you know the last couple of decades and especially post COVID. As we have absolutely been forced to walk into the virtual space as we are today, Right. It's really about how we are communicating, which is very different than we ever have before. As you and I have discussed, human communication has evolved. And there is data that shows through the 70s and 80s as education from high school to college to universities, technology schools, and virtual online blended learning. Vocabulary and knowledge has expanded and everyone has access with their thumbs. Yeah. The problem is we're not talking. Communication, which is part of soft interrogation, is about number one, active listening. How often do we actually listen to what is being said rather than thinking about what we're going to say in response? All the time, all the time waiting for your turn to speak. Absolutely. Secondly, 93% of all communica human communication is non-verbal. Oh. Think about that. The problem with the virtual space is it, it numbs our senses. So I cannot smell. I cannot feel. I cannot taste. I can only partially hear or see who I am talking to. It's very different than when we are in person where facial expressions. Right, right. Is how we really communicate. Why? We're still mammals. And one has instincts and senses that if in real life, different than virtual, you can feel the energy approaching. You can almost 
understand what that look meant and uh, whether you're in a grocery store and you see someone but don't want to connect how you avoid and walk down another <laughs> aisle. Yeah. So but let me ask you that in the, in the advantage of, okay, so we're, we're, we're using technology now here on yes. Best Talks, but yes. it gives us the opportunity to be face to face where we can experience the, um, the nonverbal communication, the, the facial expressions, the nods, et cetera. How is it affecting us when we're not here, when we're just texting? We're just communicating where there is no visual connection at all. So there is research and data that shows our beautiful ability to use our brain, which we still statistically believe only we use about 20 to 30 percent, is actually diminishing. Why? It's about we're, we're here with our thumbs, so it's tactile, but not full body tactile. OK, right. even though I can see you, if I was present in that room, I could see the micro expressions. You're moving your body, your energy. It's very different. It's dulled through this virtual space. When we talk about kind of the younger generation who are masters of the virtual universe, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems is out in public. <clears throat> they are so focused on what they are watching, which is video, not necessarily reading. That right. if someone standing next to them with a knife or a gun, they wouldn't even be aware of it. That is we so are cool. absolutely yes, yes. And part oh, of that's have, our problem. So have we become so myopic that we're yes. only into like literally what's in front of us? So we're missing, and even if at best we're only using twenty percent of our brain, which is kind of scary. Um, yep. Hopefully, we're using the best twenty percent that we have. Is is something like this? better than if we were just, let's say, talking on the phone? So even the phone is different, which is a different level of auditory, because then it's focused on the phone without the visual. Once we start to move these into whether it's a FaceTime or a virtual or an audio, different parts of our brain connect. And the dilemma is our virtual capacities have numbed our capabilities to connect at much higher and more advanced levels, which is what we were as mammals and still are, but not using those skills as much, which helps us evolve problem solving, critical thinking assessment and how we better communicate with each other. So, so being that we do live and maybe not our generations, but the younger generations live in the, the tactical world and, um, looking down, not looking around and seeing and experiencing. What is the best way for us, the most effective way for us to be communicating today? So believe it or not, and especially where I focus a lot of what I do in today's workforce in developing skills, which is the hard technical skills you need to do a job, plus the people skills, the communication skills to get the job and work as a team is finding a way between generations who communicate differently, yes, but in a hybrid workforce in person and virtual, which is a whole nother component to that, start to recognize that actually underneath their age, generation, background, race, or food type, we're still humans and we actually care. And that's good to know. I, I, I have to tell you that is so good for me to hear that when it comes down to the essence of it, and we experience it from time to time. Um, as a New Yorker, I experienced on 9-11, the 9-11, that in New York, the most diverse place in the world, at those horrific moments, everything that differentiated us vanished. Yes. yes. And in those moments, those days, those weeks, those years, that are now approaching 23 years, so hard to believe yes. next week, it'll be 23 years, that for a period of time anyway, we forgot all of that and we all became one in spirit. And it was a beautiful thing. And Absolutely. then it kind, of, it kind of, we eventually go back, I guess, to um, our individuality maybe, or our personal interests. Is that normal as well? So I love that you say that. So perception versus reality. And I'm going to lead you down exactly on September 11th, 
right? 2001, I was a stockbroker standing in my office in Missoula, Montana, and we watched it live before the markets were ready to open. I knew it was 33 years old, and I remember exactly the two thoughts I had when the second tower was hit. Number one, this was real, and we were at war. Number two, it was an opportunity for me to walk my purpose, and I had always wanted to work in human intelligence, but my father of the Vietnam era wouldn't allow me to go active duty. This was the opportunity for me to join and work for the U.S. government and take my skill sets with six languages in my background and a bachelor's degree in poli sci to really go do what I thought I was going to be great at, and that's human behavior. Better understanding how and why humans behave the way we do and be something bigger and hopefully stand up for democracy. Oh. Long story very short, within a year and a half, I sold my book of business, rented out my house, and in my little Honda, traveled from Montana to D.C., no job, no context, to see if I could get in what's called the intelligence community. Well, that's the book that's going to be coming out next year and the story behind it. But what I was blessed to doing is I got into work with human intelligence and becoming certified as an interrogator, which I never expected. It just happened that way is I realized being trained by the Marines at Quantico, human intelligence is not about hard interrogation where you hurt and manipulate and torture. It never works. No. It's the no. negative and most worst side of humanity. What works is building rapport. And the three magical things to interrogation, which is the soft interrogation you and I both do well, is we lead with kindness, empathy, and compassion. It's not about me. No. It's about actually seeing you for who you are, not what's on the outside. And sometimes the mask that you put on, it's who you truly are. Maya Angelou said it best, the eyes are the spirit to the soul. And once you look in the eyes and listen and ask open-ended questioning and respond with empathy, kindness, and compassion, you build rapport and trust, which yeah. allows someone to truly see you and realize we can help each other no matter where on planet Earth we come from and how we can actually do this as humanity. It sounds, and it is, it is so basic. It is so yes. logical. It is so practical. Yes. Why? So why is it always presented? You're talking about Quantico and... Um, interrogation and why is it always presented to us as as negative as bullying as hardcore as yep. <coughs> manipulation why is it always presented to us that way well the reality is you go back to the beginning of time and you and i had shared earlier we're mammals and we have not evolved very much from surviving as a pack but also male versus female control power, the pros and cons, the negatives and positives of being human, because we are both evil and good. It is, do you turn it into all about self, which is ego, manipulation, control, dominance, which is what hard interrogation was and why it was used during that time by very evil people yeah. who had power and control and money. And thank you, time and place, I was part of those teams and going to deploy and me, but I was not alone. 41% of us who had come into that career field post 9-11 through funding through Congress walked away. We left the industry because it was inhumane, it was immoral and violating treaties and humanitarian laws. And I chose to walk away from that career path to become a U.S. Air Force spouse and a mom. And oh. as I walk my journey using the skills the Marines who know how to do it correctly taught me to share it with today's workforce and hopefully make a difference in the future and the next generation of leaders. Well, you're a mom, so I mean that's happening whether you're aware of it or not. You're you're that's doing right. that job. AI. Okay, I am not a technical person at all. I'm not tactical. I'm strategic. I'm a visionary. I'm a verbal communicator. I'm a good listener. Yes. 
AI, I know it's not going away. I know I have to make my own adjustments to live with it, to accept it, and even to use it for good. Right. Am I correct, Megan, in believing that there are some things that AI cannot replace as far as human skill? Absolutely. The biggest problem now is that the assumption that artificial intelligence will replace human intelligence expects human intelligence and artificial intelligence to have the same level of intelligence. Hmm. As I mentioned earlier, two very different kinds of intelligence. And the reality is that nothing can replace human intelligence. It will try to imitate, it will try to replicate, and it will learn and grow from the input we provide it. However, I believe in my heart and soul that nothing will replace what the powers of the universe have created, whatever your religious philosophy or not, because humans are more intelligent than anything else. I just figured it out. Human intelligence and AI have brains. Yes. But only humans have hearts. Bingo. It's the magic that separates us and the spirit. Let's add all three in there. It gets complicated. And I believe that we have got to spend more time and change the approach to what in today's workforce is known as human resources and start to infuse more training and education so that humans within their workforce can not only learn and expand and control, not control, let me erase that, embrace, collaborate, and hold accountable the AI we're creating because we have to do it. It's out. We have to work together so that there is a positive to the negatives that currently exist and start to negate the biases and the different problems that we are seeing when a we might have a world dominated by machines. Humans are going to be the solution to change this trajectory. Because behind the artificial intelligence is human intelligence. We created it. We yes. created it. It can't grow. So, you know, we see a lot of science fiction kind of stuff, maybe, or it's my perception of it, is that it's going to take the world over. But it can't because we humans are the brains behind the technology. That's right. But also what's happening is a lot of artificial intelligence, not all, because it's expanding and changing you know, every minute of every day as right. we infuse into it and they expand that code. It's really, what is it receiving? Is it receiving primarily our negative side of who we are as humans? Oh, well, sure. And how are we going to infuse the positive so that we can keep it in check? Absolutely, absolutely. And move together. Yeah. And, and you say with technology, it's two sides of the same coin. You can take That's the right. same information and use it for good or use it for evil. And so it's kind of a race. Who's winning? As soon as the technology exists, what's your motive? What's your, what's your motivation? What's your end goal? Going back to the power, the greed, the ego that you mentioned earlier. So how do you want to use that intelligence? So artificial or human. So that's where it comes down to the human making the decision. And that goes back to something you and I were talking about earlier. It's about who is control and how diverse is the representation of age, gender, race, language, background, food type. Right. How is the diverse world of humans being part of the solution or is it being controlled in that data by those who run and control the power? The negative versus the positive. We've got to do the checks and balances yeah, and continue yeah. to be part of yeah. the solution. You know, a hundred years ago when I was growing up and early in business, there was a saying, you know, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. That's so right. it's perspective, which team are you playing for? You know, the good guys or the bad guys? And, uh, you know, metaphorically speaking, and hopefully the good guys staying at least a chapter ahead in the book, a page ahead in the story or whatever. Yeah. But I guess that's where going back to human intelligence, human weakness comes into play because it is about greed. It is about jealousy. Those are two heinous uh, factors that motivate right. people's yep. behavior. Um, Absolutely. And it's true in criminality. It's true in, uh, in uh, blue.
So welcome back. We are here for part two of this amazing conversation that we're here uh, with Megan. We're really discussing, um, I'm going to say like, not necessarily the pros and the cons of human intelligence versus artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence clearly cannot exist without human intelligence behind it, which I think is very good news. Let's go on to talking about that this is all, I'm thinking, a reaction to what we've probably been experiencing as part of the animal kingdom, if you will, survival of the fittest. Yes, and, and and living in fear and having ways to protect ourselves and to overcome whoever it was that we thought was a threat to us. Um, is that kind of part of it? Absolutely. That's what makes it so complex. So since the beginning of time, right, whatever your philosophy is of evolution and how we've gotten as humans to where we are today, is we cannot erase millions of years of programming based on fear. That fear is that instinct mm. to fight what is a threat or unknown, to freeze so you're not recognized and hopefully they go away, or to flee, which leads to mental health, just to survive. Oh, so fight, fight, and freeze, and there's new concepts and new things that we're doing to develop. Well, how do humans behave the way they do? And why do you behave different than I do? Part of it is design. It's in your instinct and your DNA code based on your ancestors. The second part of that is recognizing in today's society, you still respond that way when you're probably not going to die. And mm. I'll give you a great example. I was in first grade and I was getting bullied. Everybody think about when you were bullied, especially as a child. So step into that space. I recognized in a classroom that every time the teacher said, raise your hand, I, my hand was in the air. Isn't that what you're supposed to do? But there were three girls across the classroom who would give me the look like nonverbal communication. It was a clue that I was doing something wrong, but I didn't understand. Then out in the playground where the school of hard knocks and reality hits, <laughs> It became verbal. You're such a know-it-all, teacher's pet. Why are you oh. trying to make me look so bad? This was their verbal response to attack because why? I was not behaving like them. I was making them look bad. And it was jealousy. But as a first grader, you don't know that. No. The problem is after the nonverbal visual and the verbal verbal, then it became tactile. And they actually yeah. shoved me down oh. and I got hurt. Well, oh. long story to the point, I was in first grade. I got sent home and my dad sent me down. And my dad, while I was seven years old in first grade, said, Megan, you're dealing with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, fight, flight, or freeze response. And I'm like, dad, what is that? Long story to the point. He said, when you go back to school, you are going to deal with the same thing. And I want you to approach it differently. Change your response. Because what I was doing was fleeing. I was running away. He said, stand your ground and breathe. Don't fight because fight begets fight. Negative right. and negative. It never works. Don't flee because that becomes mental health and you suppress it. Not good either. He said, this time, next time it happens, stand your ground and breathe. Because the truth is, she's just jealous and resentful yeah. of you. Yeah. What you need to do, which is the magic of soft interrogation, is with kindness, compassion, and empathy, I said to her, why are you treating me this way? It's not what you say, it's how you yes. say it. And in that moment, it changed my entire program. She looked at me like, and walked away. She never touched me again, no. never bullied me, and never gave me the look. Yeah. Why? Because I cared, I asked, and I neutralized the threat. Right, right. We need to and, learn and this as leaders. We as do, women. we do. As and what a shame leaders. that we haven't learned it, you know, earlier. My husband always says, you know, people will continue to bully you until you put your hand up and say stop. That's right. That's now, right. I wish I were in your first grade class with you because I wouldn't have tolerated witnessing you being bullied. I'm the daughter of a guy who couldn't stand bullies. 
Uh, he was a champion of the underdog. And he raised all of us with that oh, kind of mindset. Um, how blessed. You know, how blessed that you stand for the person who can't really stand for themselves. That's where your leadership begins, not by joining the team. And, uh, and I was never bullied because I wouldn't have I wouldn't have stood for it. And no, I wouldn't have. And therefore, people would never even try because I guess they That's just right. knew. But it's it's being part of the pack, I guess. The pack mentality to survive. To survive. It's being you're pressured. Exactly. If you're part of the pack, you're probably less fearful because there's power in numbers. Absolutely. Security, stability, Maslow's base of his hierarchy of needs. Correct. You know, it's so, it's so like everything is connected. It's so it's so basic. It makes so much sense. So have we been living in a world, are we living in a world where we are trying to complicate things? Are we trying to like create this, this aura of something that really isn't necessary? Because if we go back to basics, mm -hmm. yep. at the core, as you said, we're mammals, we're humans, we have more, there's more alike we, we share more than, than we have differences. We should honor the differences. But when we yes. stay in together, as I said, we did in New York after 9-11 and around the United States, of course. But we in New York were, you know, tasting it in the air and smelling it. It was different. We lost so many, you know, friends and classmates and, and, and spouses of friends, what have you. Um, have we just been trying to complicate it? So it's a matter of interpretation, but I think yes, to some degree. And I think the fear-based mindset still controls the world. And the problem is that even though the data shows the world is safer than it's ever been, even though there are exceptions and hotspots where mm -hmm. trauma and war still exist, it is few and less than it ever has been before. So when we as humans around planet earth with the internet of things and resources to learn and have information, which didn't exist 20, 30, 40 years ago, you'd think that we would evolve to a more kind, compassionate, empathetic space. Yeah. But the reality is from COVID to virtual to capitalism, and I'm neither negative or positive, but money controls how we and, operate. Yeah, of course, yeah. It yeah. still comes down to the hierarchy, old way of old approach of whoever has the most controls the outcomes. And we, no matter what level we are within society or where we come from, age, gender, race, need to recognize we should not fear for our life. We should stand up and use our voice and learn to ask, why is this happening? And address it with a better level of emotional intelligence, which is a whole nother topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. not about you, it's about there's a problem. How can I offer solutions so that we can dissolve this and be better as humanity? So and I'm gonna emotion, tie it also, yeah. yeah, and I'm gonna tie it also, 9-11 was a catastrophic event. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to death, that's when humanity flips. Because even in those moments, and I was not there, I just watched it, they became part of the solution because I felt it, is that when devastation and trauma happens, we all want to help. It's our design. Yeah. And this is nothing new. Even though we will always protect self and pack first, which is why bad guys die to protect what they do, even though they live in a world that is very different than ours, okay? It's because they're protecting those they love. No matter where you are on planet Earth, that is the truth. The reality in today's world is we don't have to kill each other anymore. Right. We can communicate what is your need and what is your problem and how we can meet in the middle and negotiate evil and good so that we can stay more balanced as humanity in the artificially intelligent age. Yeah. And really that is it. And it comes down to that word balance. 
which uh, women are all women, I think, in particular, are always striving for. We we talk about it with work life balance and I've had different uh, perspectives on it saying, but we only have one life. We're only one person. You can't turn off your work, especially for entrepreneurs. You can't turn that off and turn on your personal. We are one. We're, we're doing this 24 seven. It's like being right. a mom. What what is this? I'm glad you went there. What Center. is this very interesting diagram behind you? Absolutely. So this is a what could be a five minute to 30 minute activity we do in our workshops and our retreats. And what it is is a three step process, short and sweet. At the end of the day, how do you think the world perceives you? And it's about asking what whose expectations do you live up to every day? Who are you? Who have you become in order to survive with the pack in society, in work and in life? That's what step one is about. How do you perceive the world sees you? It's quite wait, wait a second. How I experience. see the world is how the world sees me. Is that what you just said? Exactly. Yeah. So how do you believe the world sees you? Give me three words, Beth. How do you think the world perceives that? I'm so not good at these things. Um, okay. I'm I'm compassionate compassionate i am thoughtful yes i'm kind i'm a good listener um i have high energy i'm a verbal communicator um i'm a storyteller love that so what's wonderful is when we do this as a group everybody writes it down it's the audiovisual tactile audiovisual tactile right and then we share it and they're like oh that's not true. I see you as this. And what we begin to realize is you have positive words. You have two or three syllable words. <laughs> not everybody speaks that way. Not everybody sees this way. One of these that I'll hold up was done at a workshop with a soldier, PTSD. Angry, cruel, stressed, quiet. Oh, that's sad. And you so when we do these activities, we really allow people to let out what their thoughts are, which is a certain part of the brain and recognize how do you believe the word perceives you negative or positive? So should I add to that egotistical? <laughs> so the reality is you are a little bit of both and that's where we go. And we start to list the negatives and the positive because the truth is there are two sides of you and it can be interpreted by others subjectively. What I've learned through life, though, and the, the word humility, whereas people think that that's supposed to be putting yourself down and be very self-effacing, that that's not what no. humility is. Humility no. is the recognition of truth. So is it now, not? bingo, girl, step two. After you do that and say, how's the word perceiving you? And you put the negatives and the positives. Then you start to say, step two, right today in this moment, how do you really feel inside? You have humility. I think right? I'm on, I, I am modest. Honest. I feel blessed. Mm -hmm. Bingo. Any negatives? And well, of course there have to be negatives. I'm human. I'm yes. human. What yes. I've learned though, I've learned as a as and I think. You learn it through, you know, being around as long as I've been around is that you do become, you should know yourself very well, and you should be able to identify your own strengths and weaknesses. Yes. Um, I think we're all good at recognizing what we think are other people's strengths and weaknesses. Um, and we're quick to assume and judge label and bias. I'm non-judgment. I don't judge. And I just said that to someone very near and dear to me over the weekend. We were having a conversation and he was kind of asking an opinion, but kind of made it known to me his opinion and what he hoped I would agree with his opinion, which I didn't necessarily, and I didn't want to become antagonistic. So I said, I said, I'm not, I'm, I'm just not judgmental. But I'm here's why. It's because you have advanced. Oh. You have learned. Your in human intelligence has grown through the different developmental stages. And your story is part of that. 
but you recognize it's not about me. It's about others. Emotional intelligence, social intelligence are learned intelligences that technology is not helping the next generation learn. It's doing just the opposite. And we talked about that. So as you, and look you know at where my- I think I learned that I grew up in a big family, the oldest girl in a big family. And with being the oldest girl in a big family, you had certain responsibilities. I, you had them just because you had them, but I also yes. assumed a lot of them. That's right. And that's and right. you learn that when you're part of a family, it's a team. It's a, and we all played sports. And so we knew the team spirit. We knew about that. And, th- and those are so many lessons to be learned um, through sports yes. and, and learning and being out for the team and not just for yourself. You win and lose together. Absolutely. But hey, are families multiplying like we used to? No, they're no, shrinking. No, yeah. There's countries that are encouraging four-day work weeks so people can actually date in South Korea. So, and the problem is you've hit it. We are not learning these skills. And because of quiet quitting, the great resignation, everything that COVID and the virtual hybrid workspace is creating, these are skills that are diminishing in awarenesses. And let me bring it full circle. So as you identify how you believe the word perceives you versus your reality and how you truly feel, the key is every day, every moment, are you even aware of if you're in a negative or a positive and how it affects others, which is that toxic in a workplace. So centered, is it zero? Where you feel you are aware of your positives, but you're also aware of your negatives. And my question to you to bring this full circle is on a scale of negative 10 mean not in a good place, zero being centered and positive 10 being, oh my gosh, you just won the lottery yesterday yeah wow where that would, would you, be great <laughs> where would you put yourself today on that scale of negative 10 through zero to positive 10 well I'll, I'll, I'll put myself on that scale by my best friend who's like another sister to me who i've known for my entire life and she said to me many years ago she said beth what's and i'm very much my father's daughter in this way she said and she was saying it about herself she said about herself, she said, boy, when I'm angry at anybody, I take it out on the whole world. She said, everybody knows if I'm angry. She said, Beth, if you're angry at someone, you never know it and you don't take it out on the rest of the world. And I think that's a level of maturity that yes. as, a, as a woman in business, that yes. you, have to, you have to know what your role is in any given moment and the impact that you can and should and must have on other people. Absolutely. When it comes to customer service, when it comes to sales, when it comes to people, humanity, big or small. I used to, as a new time mom, put myself in timeout. <laughs> I would say, mommy in timeout. Right now, now. We need some peace and quiet. Away. Yeah. Don't come until yeah. the bell rings because I'm not in a good place. And it's about what you said earlier, my dear. It's about being honest with where you are and why you're that way, as long as you're aware, you will grow and evolve and gain the skills to better connect not only with the work that you do, but as a person and as a leader. So what's your number today? Negative 10 number? I guess. Um, Where am I today? Um, I, I hope I'm very centered. Yes. I'd say you're in a beautiful center and I know we're just getting to know each other, but it's about being honest that you're in a really good place, you know, and it's being aware with, like you shared, what's going on in your personal life, what's going in your professional life. But in this moment today with the amazing conversation and knowledge that we're sharing, how can we communicate better? And most importantly, instead of saying, how are you today? Say, where are you today? Ah. Yeah. And that takes the level of saying, you know what, I'm in the negative, even though this is not true. What if I said, you know what, Beth, today I'm a negative too. This happened, this happened, this happened. And then what that's happens, okay. That's okay. That's okay. Because then and there's then room we'll start for a conversation. Improvement. Yes. There's room for improvement and it's about being aware. It's not and about And then denial. we connect. And then okay. we connect and people genuinely say, how can I help? 
How and then I all help? of a sudden it improves just like that. That's that's my thing. What can I do to help? That's that's exactly. kind of my thing. When people unload and you talked about customer service, and I've trained customer service departments, and that's yes. kind of my my way of letting letting just be very calm. I've heard people be very on both sides, be very yep. combative. And I said, if you think that's going to help anything. So that's yeah. part of what I do in my training, my sales training, my my whole cycle. You mentioned earlier, which I was not aware of before, you mentioned retreats and yes. uh, and what else? You said retreats and yes. So I, I am I, like many business owners. I've been an entrepreneur for 11 years, former military spouse that led me into this people skill area of mastery and human intelligence. And right now, my primary focus is sharing this message as a keynote speaker at conferences nationally and internationally, really from teams that are about, you know, 1,000 to 5,000 employees. And here's why. There is a whole shift that's happening in our workforce. And once I do keynote speaking, I can then do virtual leadership training. And it's about the multi-generation teams that are really frustrated and don't know how to communicate because of the different generations and mindsets. And through my one-on-one -on -one coaching that we do virtual for leadership teams of five to 10 people, they start to recognize, oh my gosh, this is how I communicate. No wonder it's not going well with this individual. And how do we start to be honest with where we are, perception versus reality, and start to shift our approach, interrogation style, to better listening, better communication with kindness, empathy, and compassion. Nobody thinks like you, and it's putting your ego aside and becoming emotionally intelligent and aware. You have knowledge and skills. We can solve these problems. So together. does this work within the workplace? It works in society. Does it work in personal relationships like husband and wife? All what's so wonderful is it doesn't matter what age, gender, race, or relationship you're in. It's about what I call skills for life, mm -hmm. which is an acronym and the methodology. L, when you look in the mirror each morning and listen to your inner voice, your conscience, are you being brutally honest with where you are and where you're not? Then once you start to listen and be honest with who you are and take off the mask, it's I, imagining where you want to be instead of a fear-based looking back. It's about imagining your future one to three or five years and setting goals. Once you start to have a mindset that is positive and future-driven, you start to then F, focus better one day at a time on the skills you need to learn and mature and grow to get where you want to be. Last but not least, as you look in the mirror, listen, imagine and focus on each step personally and professionally to live your best life. E is about empowering others along the way because you can't do it alone. we got to collaborate and help each other keep humanity alive. Listen, it's a very lonely life if you're traveling it alone. That That's I know. Right. Can I kind of promise listeners that we're going to well, maybe this isn't fair to do to you. Is it possible, I won't say promise, but is it possible to say that we can um, think about offering something as a workshop, as a master class, et cetera? Absolutely. An experience to work with you. I would in a group be honored to okay. do that. Absolutely. Well, that's what I want to do because you just landed on that with the E in life, empower others. That's my goal. That's my job. Yep. From the Global Society of Empowered Women, which is really what sponsors Beth Talks, it's about women empowering women, women standing up and teaching other women that you have a voice, it's worth hearing. You have yes. a story, it's worth telling. And there Absolutely. are people out there, if you, if you allow yourself to hear your own voice and then be willing to share it with others, you can have an immeasurably, immeasurably powerful impact. Yes. You may never know the people, whose lives you've changed. You may never know their names. You may never know how. And that's okay. You did it. You can be that pebble that drops in the water that has that ripple effect, that energy that goes and grows forever and ever till you don't see it anymore. And it'll hit a shore on a foreign land and that energy will be picked up by someone and God bless them. <laughs> Absolutely. I feel blessed to be your part of the ripple. <laughs> oh my gosh, you are. Miga, I, I said at the beginning of this in episode one, we're now ending episode two. 
is that there was so much about you in reading about you that intrigued me that I wanted to have you as a guest. You've addressed all of it, but as a listener and what happens, I think this is the most powerful thing in really good communication. In answering questions, in giving answers, more questions are born. Ta-da! And that's great communication and that's growth. Absolutely. And the sweet spot, and this is future conversation, why is the magical word. What Simon Sinek start with why began, I have evolved into a methodology, coaching and training, which takes why to a whole nother degree, as well as who, what, when, where, and how. Yeah, the why is, but yeah, because the why, but you know what I always say when people have said to me about doing different things, why? Why that? And I say, why not? Bingo. And, why not? And we think, and this goes back, future pebble to throw later. Why is it that a three-year-old, that is their first word, but society shuts them down. Do as you're told. Shut up in color. Oh, because I oh, said so. Yeah, Don't ask yeah. why. That has got to stop. We no, have yes. to encourage everyone. Why? How? When? Where? What? Because that allows us to neurologically discover exactly what we don't know and connect at a whole nother level, which is well, human intelligence. I told you, I'm a Socratarian. I think probably why was probably the first and the second and the third and the fourth word out of my mouth. Why, why, why? Yes. Um, and I say it to people when I ask questions now, I say, it's not that I don't believe or trust you. I'm learning from you. Um there's a saying that I saw last week. It was in Latin. We were talking about Latin on a private conversation. And it was, um, I wish I could say it in Latin. I will find out. But the interpretation of it was, in teaching, we are learning. Yes. And every time you bring a new student, if you will, a new person into your audience, they're bringing their experiences. You never know what they're going to contribute. But they're Absolutely. there for a reason. They have their own why. And if you're open to it and that it's always a collaborative exchange, it's always right. communication, it's always the dialogue. That's where the magic happens. That's where the secret sauce is. And that's Absolutely. where growth is always possible. Absolutely. And I'll give you the kind of perfect little story behind human intelligence, which Zig Ziglar said it best in retail sales. You can have everything you need and want if you will give others what they need and want. What they first. need and want. Right. Yeah. God bless you. That's, that's probably one of his most, he has, I mean, there's a plethora of them, but that's probably the most frequently quoted Zig Ziglar quote. Yeah. You can have anything yes. you want if you help other people get what they want. Yeah. First. A loose interpretation. Megan, I, I, I want to say, I want to feel like I should feel exhausted. <laughs> after this conversation, but I don't. I feel so I invigorated. I, I feel, feel so the same. Invigorated. Your energy and enthusiasm, your passion, and everything about you. I think we found a wonderful, magical component, and we're going to make sure we just continue this energy and keep the ripple and, going and you know to what? bring others and share it. And that's a blessing that we have, and it's a blessing that we can share. And again, it goes back to Bep Talks, beliefs, experiences, and passions. And when you put all of those together and you speak from experience, um, that's where the wisdom, when we get to the our ages, um, that's where the wisdom starts to filter through. Because we've done that. We've been there. We've done it. We've survived Absolutely. it. We've survived And those stories it. need to be shared. So that others can learn and hopefully do better. Amen. Amen. So to our listening audience, thank you as always. You see, we have a, a treasure trove of information here through Megan. And um, there will be more. I promise you that. We will get to everybody. Uh, I knew this was going to be a fascinating, it's the longest pep talk we've ever done, which doesn't surprise me <laughs> at all. So thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for your beliefs, your experiences, clearly your passions. You mentioned that you were a military wife. What, what service was your husband in? Yeah, my former spouse was a C-17 U.S. Air Force pilot. My dad was in the Air Force, World War II. Family. Yeah, another, another common denominator. He was very well decorated. He was the first one to fly um, using night vision, night radar. 
And yeah, and then he became an educator for younger uh, misbehaved, if you will, misbehaved members of the military. That's how he knew how to raise all us kids. He had it. That's right. He had it. That's that good and negative. He knows both. <laughs> he knew the balance. He had it. He sure did. So as we always say at, at the Global Society of Empowered Women, may the best always be yet to come in each one of us individually, in groups of us collectively, as families, in, as, as communities, as cultures. Um, it all begins one person at a time. And if we all just make that little adjustment, we can make huge, huge shifts in the world. And boy, couldn't we use that right about now? Absolutely. Thank you Absolutely. so much, Beth. Thank you so much. So I want to say to everybody, thanks so much as always for listening. And um, until we talk again, may the best always be yet to come. Bye for now. Bye. Talk to you soon.